Good evening. On behalf of Oberlin College and its Board of Trustees, I'm honored to welcome you here this evening. This dinner marks the opening of a conference honoring Eduardo Shimbambo uh, Mondlan, Oberlin class of 1953. I want to welcome those of you who are here in Oberlin to celebrate Eduardo Mondlan's life and accomplishments. Educating leaders has always been a central part of Oberlin College's heritage, and it is and will remain central to our mission to both educate and support young men and women as they shape their personal vision of how to change our, and improve our world. Eduardo Mondlan will forever be a stellar role model for us. I'm honored to acknowledge members of Eduardo Mondlan's family, his wife, Janet Ray Mondlan, his daughter, Chude Mondlan, and his son, Eduardo Mondlan, Jr. And Oberlin College and I offer a warm welcome, too, to Dr. Leonardo Santos Simao, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation of the Republic of Mozambique. Minister Simao will present the conference's keynote address this evening at First Church. Events such as this conference are the result of a great deal of work and careful planning. The person with the inspiration and the energy, and certainly the doer of a great deal, the great majority of the hard work for this conference, is Al McQueen, Professor Emeritus of Sociology here at Oberlin. He has organized, as you know, uh, what promises to be a most interesting and inspiring series of presentations and discussion tonight and tomorrow. I'm also happy to tell you that in honor of Eduardo Mondlan's accomplishments and his relationship to Oberlin. Oberlin College is establishing a new scholarship in his name. This is the description of that new scholarship. Eduardo Mondlan founded and served as the first president of the Front for the Liberation of Mozambique. His efforts within this organization and with a diverse coalition of forces led to Mozambique independence in 1975. Although he did not live to see his vision realized, his strong leadership was a critical force in changing the political shape of Africa. This four-year full tuition scholarship will be awarded to a student from a sub-Saharan African country. We are delighted to be able to establish this scholarship at Oberlin, and we are proud of this most distinguished alumnus of our college. It's now my pleasure to introduce Bill Perlick, class, Oberlin class of 1948, who is the chairman of our board of trustees here at the college, uh, who will also say a few words of welcome to you here this evening. Mr. Perlick. Most of the time when I have the opportunity to stand behind this podium in this room, I get fed before I'm called upon to make remarks. <laughs> now, Al McQueen drives a very hard bargain, and I'm hoping that when I return to the table, my salad will still be there. Some uh, 60 years ago, as a young stamp collector, I had an exciting picture of Mozambique. It was that magical place somewhere in Africa that delivered some of the most exciting specimens in my album. Stamps in eye-arresting shapes, triangles, horizontal rectangles, diamonds, as well as the upright square shapes that most issuers make so dreary in the catalogs. And the colors were eye-popping. Red, lilac, bistro brown, sea green, ultramarine, turquoise, chocolate, and more. The subjects were exotic portraits of lions, tigers, giraffes, hippos, rhinos, and gigantic snakes 
along with men paddling what seemed to be dugout canoes and women running with unbelievable extension that was, must surely have been remarkable speeds. I recall this not to trivialize the great man whom we honor this weekend, nor his country. Rather, I wish to acknowledge how great the opportunity this weekend has presented for me to do some more reading and learning about Mozambique, and how far I have yet to go before I begin to understand and appreciate the part of the world in which Eduardo Mundlan did his life work. Mozambique did not free itself officially from Portuguese imperialism until June 25, 1975, about six years after Eduardo's murder. It was home then to perhaps nine to 10 million persons with Christians somewhat outnumbering Muslims in a culture where tradition and traditional beliefs were and remain strong. Like so many newly emerged nations in Africa and elsewhere, indeed like our own country, independence did not come easily for Mozambique. As early as 1962, the Mozambique Liberation Front, led by Eduardo, formed and in 1964 it launched a military campaign. Independence from Portugal in 1975 did not mark the beginning of peace, and stability for Mozambique was disturbed by a devastating civil war, quickly followed by uneasiness from some of the neighboring countries who thought that in Mozambique there were bases and operations that threatened their own sense of security. Finally, in 1994, just a few years ago, with substantial assistance from the United Nations, accommodations were eventually reached and a national electoral commission and elected national government were established. Now one can sense the sweep of the pain and suffering that hit Mozambique citizens by a few stark numbers. One and a half million refugees were repatriated from neighboring countries. Four to five million displaced people were replaced, something at that time on the nature of 30% of the entire population. 80,000 former combatants were reintegrated into civilian life. One legacy of this that will survive, as Professor McQueen told me the other day, is that Mozambique is one of the world's three nations where a stroll in the countryside is very hazardous. In Cambodia, Angola, and Mozambique, the risk from landmines remains very strong. Yet Mozambique may be on the verge of a dramatic economic and social change. Two weeks ago, the New York Times compared the gross domestic product per person in Mozambique of $152 per year with South Africa's 3,000 and America's 28,000, and noted that a drop in inflation from 6% to 6% from 70% had occurred in 1994. While the Times can refer to Mozambique as, quote, a torchbearer of the African Renaissance, close quote, its role, according to the same Times article, quote, is still much like its colonial one, being exploited by foreign buyers of raw materials. As President Chisano noted, Mozambique has titanium, but does not export aircraft parts, exports logs, but does not export timber or furniture. Dr. Leonardo Samayo, whom we will have the opportunity to hear in a few minutes in First Church, devoted his life to attacking directly Mozambique's wrenching social problems before he took his current post as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation. A practicing physician and surgeon, he began serving in district and provincial health posts in 1982 in a nation where life expectancy is just over 46 years and where there is only one physician for 37,200 inhabitants. 
He was a founding member of both the Mozambique Medical Association and the Mozambique Association of Public Health. And from 1988 to 1994, Dr. Samao was Minister of Health of the Republic and took up the teaching of medicine at the Mundelein University in the national capital. Beginning in 1995, he chaired Mozambique's National Mine Clearance Commission, confronting directly what may be his nation's most pressing social and health problem. I look forward to hearing Dr. Smiles' remarks when we join him in the First Church, and I hope all of you will be there with us too. Thank you. Well, this is a rather moving occasion for me, not simply because I have worked so furiously the last three or four months on this, but also because this is the, to me, a kind of a celebration of 47 years of relationship in some form or other with Ed Eduardo Chivambo Manlan. When he came to Oberlin in 1951 as a 31-year-old transfer student who had been to Witwatersrand Whit University and University of Lisbon, uh, and incidentally, the man who was responsible for his coming is in the audience, Daryl Randall, who's just back from South Africa and who uh, started a peace institute in Johannesburg in the late 1940s when Eduardo was still in South Africa. Uh, a, a peace institute is dealing with it was, uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to miss a name now. What's the name of the president? Okay. okay. Right. Well, uh, Randall was instrumental in getting what is called, I think, a Methodist Crusade Fellowship for Eduardo to come to uh, the United States. And he, not only that, but he apparently came and talked with President Bill Stevenson to make sure that Eduardo get into Oberlin. And by gosh, in the fall of 1951, the word got around campus that this remarkable African was here. Well, it turns out that I was president of a student NAACP, and uh, I said, well, we should do something about this man. So I got a hold of Eduardo, and we made a friendship just like that, and I invited him to give his first speech at Oberlin College in uh, a, a, a place that n most of you will not have heard of, Goodrich Hall, which we didn't have a student union in those days, but we had Goodrich. And Eduardo was electrifying, and his charisma and his uh, remarkable qualities shone through beautifully, and from then on, everyone respected him. He spoke all around the area, and he was quite a speaker. Well, uh, in 1958, I visited Eduardo and Janet, and uh, Eduardo Jr., who's sitting here, <laughs> at um, 150, Dash 95 Village Road, apartment GA, Jamaica, Queens, New York. And he was an infant. <laughs> and I did not see him or talk with him again until June of 95 in London when I was in Fitzroy Square uh, and just walking around. And by gosh, I saw the uh, Mozambique Council and I went in and asked them if they had it, uh, uh, Janet Munlan's number or address or anything, and they said, no, but her son lives in, in, in London. What? <laughs> so I got the number and called, and my gosh. Well, one of the most memorable occasions was 1962, September 62. I was in Dar es Salaam, and Eduardo was there, and I didn't know it. He was, uh, they were having the first annual conference, or Frelimo. And friends told me about this fabulous African in town, a Mozambican, at the Twigger Hotel. Well, I, went, I was living at the Twigger Hotel, and I went there, and by gosh, we had a ball. The last, if I shouldn't go on like this because we don't have much time, 
But let me just simply say, the last event was very, very memorable as well. And that is in the spring of 1965, I was a professor at Brooklyn College, and I got the message that Eduardo was coming to the African American Institute to speak. So I, I went over to the speech, and we uh, you know, had a great reunion, and uh, I drove him back home after, at the end. And where did I drive him? If you New Yorkers, or people who know New York, suppose I were to say Eduardo Monlon staying at 55 Sutton Place. You know Sutton Place? That is the richest that there is. <laughs> and he was staying with the CEO of Corning Glass. And I mention that only for this reason, and that is, I think it may have been at his funeral, and it may have been Ed Hawley who said it. I don't know, and I shouldn't accuse you of this, but I think I read you said something, call him a revolutionary statesman. And so he was, a revolutionary statesman. He could be with the richest and the poorest, and still maintain his values, his visions, and he uh, his legacy is something that uh, we are very, very proud of, and I hope in the future after this conference we will know more about that legacy and it will be more central to what we're doing here at Oberlin. This conference was not my idea initially. Uh, we started, I got a call from a student, uh, Chris Gabarik class of 95, it was late, it was the, the fall of 1995, and he said that he was a member of a student organization called CLAWS, C-L-A-W-S, the Coalition Against Apartheid and White Supremacy. And they were trying to start a project to honor Eduardo Monlon. Well, I didn't, I asked him, why do you know about Eduardo Monlon? You knew very little. But he had been, and other students had been around uh, fighting the, the anti-apartheid fight, and one of the students was from South Africa. Uh, oh my gosh, Vuyo Dunjwa, Vuyo Dunjwa. And uh, they, people began to ask them about what we were doing for one of our heroes, Eduardo Monlan. They didn't know anything about them, him. So they came back and began doing research and eventually said, this man is really a great hero of Oberlin and we should be doing something. They had the idea of having a bust or a plaque put in Peter's Hall. Well, I don't know whether you've seen it yet, but you will, I'm sure. There is a plaque now in Peter's Hall because of the, the students from Claus. The students have this habit of graduating and they left me holding the ball, uh, the bag or whatever you want to call it. And eventually, I was able, with a lot of assistance, to, uh, to get that plaque installed. And in May, we had a dedication of it. And it was my idea somewhere along the way that this is so big and it was growing all the time, we really need something else. So I proposed to my colleagues, I'll introduce them in a second, that we have a conference. And it just sort of began to snowball. And this has been a remarkable process because people have come, so to speak, out of the woodworks and I, I receive letters from people I never heard of or telephone calls. In fact, even this last week, uh, this, this week, I received a call from a uh, gentleman who's in the room now and I called his friend who he told me to call and it turns out she's Janet Monlon's niece. And it just happened like this. Uh, same thing with uh, Darrell Randall. He heard about it from a lady who's in this room also, Dorothy Nyland, who incidentally is probably our oldest person here. She's 93 and she came to this conference. Uh, and uh, she informed him and it just happened that way. So it's a marvelous, marvelous occasion. I don't want to take all the credit because it's a community development, not just simply an Al McQueen development. First of all, three people became the self-appointed program committee for this occasion. Uh, myself, John Elder, and Ann Elder, and they are in the audience too. And we worked very, very hard and collaboratively. It happened they live up in Burdett, New York, so I did a lot of work. <laughs> And I was able to get co-sponsors, as you 
when you see the program, if you don't have it, on the back. Uh, President Dai was a great contributor in many ways. Dean Clayton Coppice, the same. Uh, in the Alumni Association, uh, Margaret Erickson and others, the College Library, and we'll hear more about that if you, if you go to the, uh, the commencement, I mean, the um, keynote address. Four, six departments contributed, and representatives from six departments, faculty and students, are in the room. I'd like to particularly acknowledge people who made extraordinary contributions, financial and otherwise. As you, on the program on the back, it says 139 members of the classes of 52, 53, 54. They are co-sponsors of, of the conference. Uh, in the audience is Ethel Ackerson, who made a major contribution from the fund of her late husband, Garrett uh, Ackerson, a man who wrote me one of those letters. Out of the blue, I received this letter uh, from a man who remembered Eduardo very well and very, very fondly. This man was a, an industrialist who founded a company in Illyria called the Cement Masonry Corporation. And he wanted very, very much to uh, support what we were doing and so on. He made contributions. And I twisted his arm on the radio, on the telephone, and there he is, Ted Goodvis, over at the other table there. Um, Adele Simmons, the president of the MacArthur Foundation, could not come. And I wish I had more time to call the names and recognize persons in the campus who did so much to make this a great success. And I wish you would join me in really showing appreciation to the members of the college community who made this, I think, a marvelous. Oh, and let me say one other thing. You have a cloth over there. You see that? That comes from Maputo, Mozambique. And it's so typical of how this conference developed. Ruth Gunn Mota, the class of 1966, works with an international organization, and she was in, she also has been in Mozambique a lot, and she speaks Portuguese. And she was there to help train counselors who are working on HIV, which is a big problem, I gather, in Mozambique. And so she sent me this marvelous uh, cloth, and I think that is a cashew nut, is it? Yes, and uh, she also sent pictures, which you'll see if you come to the session tomorrow, either the session tomorrow, we have a display board. So I really am very appreciative of her. Well, anyway, to everyone who's made this such a great success, please show your appreciation with applause. Please feel free to continue with your dinners, uh, but quietly. Uh, one, of, one of our special delights is that uh, not only uh, has uh, Janet Monlan been able to come for this occasion, but also two of Eduardo and Janet's children, uh, Eddie Jr. and uh, Chude Monlan. And uh, some of you may be aware that Chud Monlan is a, a very well-traveled and well-known singer. Uh, she said that I should introduce her only as uh, Eduardo Monlan's daughter, one of, one of his two daughters, and that that would suffice. But I don't think it really does suffice. Uh, she has sung all around the globe. Uh, she was the winner, uh, grand prize winner of the Korean International Music Festival in 1980 and the silver prize winner of the Tokyo Music Festival in 1981. 
and she has uh, done recordings, uh, producing of music in many places around the world. And uh, one of the most significant contributions that she has made was the tour all across Canada in 1995 on behalf of the campaign to ban landmines. Uh, somehow we got a little confused and we thought that the name of the song which she's going to sing is Ban the Landmines. Well, that's not quite the title of the song, but it's the theme of the song. And you didn't come to hear me, but some of you came to hear Chude, and so Chude, if you would come and grace us with your music. I sing here tonight for my father, who used to sit here in this room and study. And it is to him that I sing. There is a place where the sea washes the land, where the ocean is darkened by the bloodied sand and robs my soul. I am a child without heart, a mother with no taste, my tongue burnt by the salt of armed men. Whose weapons were these that buried my future, where only darkness lives and the land sleeps as dead? Now there is no ocean in my eyes, no music in my laugh. I'm a woman who burns to the rhythm of a fire that consumes all. Tomorrow, I bring you the beauty of perfumed things, the freshness of rivers, and the green colors of my country. And between my fingers, I'll hold the cup, brimming with the wine that sweetens the song and extinguishes the pain. Pelo homem com a arma na mão De quem será essa arma? Quem dirá meu destino? Me leva pelos caminhos Onde só mora o silêncio E a terra dorme morta Já não do fogo que tudo consome. Amanhã trago a beleza coisas perfumadas frescura dos rios cores verdes do meu país trago entre os dedos já taça onde o vinho amadurece o canto e se Mozambique, 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 Mozambique. 